So good afternoon. I hear nothing. <laughs> you guys are here for poetry. You can definitely speak up. Give voice to your feelings, right? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. OK, much better. I'm Giovanni Singleton, Ludge Poems Coordinator. Thank you all for being here today. Um, first, I'd like to invite you to sign up on our email list, which is over at the librarian's desk. Um, we also have posters with this year's complete Lunch Poems program available, so please pick one up. And also, if you're on Facebook, log on and become our friend. We'd love to see you there. And if you missed an event, uh, like Robert Hass reading Milos last, um, last month, that's available on our website, lunchpoems.berkeley.edu. Um, so catch up with us. Um, Let's see, what else? Okay, yes, next month um, we will have Larry Van Cleef Stefanen here from Ithaca, New York, um, reading. Um, so please do join us. That's next month on December 1st. Um, so do come back. In the meantime, if you'd like a bit of fiction in your life, please check out our sister program uh, on November 10th. The, uh, Story Hour, Story Hour will feature Carol Edgarian uh, across the way from 6 to 7 p.m. So um, to, uh, today, um, it, happen, it so happens that uh, the director of Lunch Poems, Robert Haas, is currently in uh, Great Britain launching the British edition of his selected poems. So in his stead, today we have John Shoptaw, who will introduce Clayton Eshelman. John Shoptaw was raised in the lowlands of the Missouri, Miss, Missouri boot heel. I would say Mississippi. All those S's. It's, by, it's on the coast of the Mississippi. Yeah, can we just kind of conflate them? I'm sorry, I'll do it again. John Shoptaw was raised in the lowlands of the Missouri boot heel. Harvard University Press has published his On the Outside Looking Out, a critical study of John Ashbery's poetry. He has written a libretto for an opera on the Lincoln assassination entitled Our American Cousin. It was composed by Eric Sawyer and performed by the Boston Modern Orchestra Project at the Academy of Music in 2008. And we have a little music outside. His poems have most recently been published in The New Yorker, Notre Dame Review, Colorado Review, and Common Knowledge. He is currently completing Times Beach, a book of poems on the Mississippi River Basin. I got to say it after all. And he teaches reading and writing of poetry in the English department here at Berkeley. Please welcome John Shoptaw. Thank you. You got to welcome me before I got to welcome you. But welcome. Once again, um, a word about translation. Uh, Translation is uh, word meaning to carry across from one place to another, and it's very much a, a project that uh, Clayton Eshelman has uh, a lot to uh, tell us about. It's cognate uh, then with uh, metaphor, which means roughly the same thing, and that would make uh, the translation something like a this is metaphorically speaking a vehicle. <laughs> the uh, metaphor in the original, uh, uh, the, the tenor, and uh, I think more to the point, it makes uh, the translator a conductor of that uh, vehicle. The little, the one that doesn't overly uh, catch your attention, but just punches your your ticket while your mind gets to remain on something else. The translator, at least the kind of amazing translator Eshelman is, is not uh, an actor. That is someone speaking through the original as though through a mask. Um, Clayton Eshelman, a professor emeritus at the English department at Eastern Michigan University, is a poet and translator of enormous range and ambition among his many volumes of poems. I would like to single out a work resulting from 30 years of study of Ice Age caves in southern France. That's Juniper Fuse. Remember the main 
title, if you can't remember the subtitle, which is Upper Paleolithic Imagination and the Construction of the Underworld. I'm planning, when I find the time, on spending a weekend in my dark and dank basement watching Werner Herzog's cave of forgotten dreams and reading Eshelman's Juniper Fuse. Above ground, uh, you may survey the vast and varied landscape of Eshelman by picking up, uh, it's not here today, but it's not far, uh, a click away as they say, the grindstone of rapport. And yes, there are kinds of rapport that are like grindstones where your wit is sharpened. Uh, a Clayton Eshelman reader, the grindstone of rapport. Clayton Eshelman is perhaps best known as the translator of uh, Cesar Vallejo, his co-translation with Jose Barcia of Vallejo's complete posthumous poetry won the National Book Award in 1979, and his translation of the complete poetry won the 2008 Landon Translation Award from the Academy of American Poets. Eshelman has also translated books of poems by Césaire, Neruda, Artaud, and Beydal, among others. We're here today to celebrate this revelatory publication. And this book you will find over here at the table. And I hope you'll all be able to browse it at the end. And uh, if you have the wherewithal, take it home with you for a, uh, just a, a pittance, a pittance and a half. Uh, we're here today to celebrate uh, this amazing book, uh, which I, I do call revelatory because we haven't seen it before. Uh, Césaire's Solar Throat Slash, the unexpurgated 1948 edition, and I'm sure Clayton Eshelman will explain uh, the subtitle of this translation for you. Uh, Eshelman founded and edited two crucial literary journals, uh, Caterpillar, this is before my time, but I've certainly uh, seen it and picked up a copy or two in the used bookstores. That's from 67 to 73. Anyone remember Caterpillar here to you? Yeah. Uh, and Sulfur, which I totally remember, uh, from 81 to 2000. For many poets and artists, Sulfur was really one of the most vitally important journals. You couldn't skip it uh, for the 90s, the 80s and the 90s. And uh, so I want to welcome poet, translator, essayist, editor, conductor, Clayton Eshelman. Thank you, John. I think the, the translator is a conductor of the pit, yes. not of the orchestra. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'm going to assume that most of you don't know a great deal about Aimé Césaire, so I'm go going to give a brief introduction to him and to this book, and then I'll read 12 poems from Solar Throat Slashed. As to the translation of the title, there's a note on it in the notes of the book, and if you're curious as to how we got from Sole Cucupe to Solar Throat Slashed, why, you can check out our note. Amy Césaire was born in Basse Pointe, Martinique, in 1913 and died in Fort de France, the capital, in 2008. The second of six children, his mother was a dressmaker and his father a local tax inspector. While attending high school at the Lycée Strocher in Fort de France, then the only secondary school for all of Guadeloupe, French Guiana, and Martinique. He was identified by his teacher as a candidate for France's highest liberal arts institution, the École Normale Supérieure in Paris. In the early 1930s, while in Paris, Césaire began to participate in his own version of the decentralization of Western culture by forming with Léon Gontran Damas and Léopold Senghor later the president of Senegal, the concept of negritude, which set as its initial goal a renewed awareness of being black in a context that included black African spirituality, 
the acceptance of one's destiny, history, and culture, and a responsibility toward the past. Césaire returned to Martinique in 1939, and in 1944, he accepted an invitation to run on the Communist Party ticket, and was not only elected mayor of Fort de France, but became a deputy in the French National Assembly in Paris as well. Imagine Walt Whitman as the mayor of Washington, D.C., as well as a Maryland senator. Mm -hmm. The French writer Michel Larisse has described Césaire's lifelong relationship with surrealism in the following words. Césaire's revolt sprang from his daily experience of injustice against the group with which he was aligned, a group that the Martinican ruling class, supported by metropolitan France, allows to stagnate in poverty and despises for its physical features as well. That is why it should not be surprising that Césaire's surrealism takes on an especially harsh and dense quality, something like a volcanic explosion, which has no need to place itself, quote, in the service of the revolution, end quote, since it was already of the same nature, having been born of the direct pressure of those harsh realities that open the way to revolutionary movements, end quote. Addressing Césaire's most famous single poem, the 50-page Notebook of a Return to the Native Land, André Breton wrote, quote, it is a black who handles the French language in a manner that no white man is capable of today. And it is a black who guides us today into the unexplored, establishing along the way, as if by child's play, the contacts that make us advance on sparks. And it is a black who is not only a black, but all of man, who conveys all of man's questionings, all of his anguish, all of his hopes, and all of his ecstasies, and who will remain more and more, for me, the prototype of dignity." End quote. Besides a half dozen collections of poetry, three plays, and several extended essays, Césaire has also produced many interviews, articles, and speeches. He is unique among 20th century black poets for the extent to which he has never ceased to be black while drawing upon and assimilating into his work a full range of Western literature and philosophy, including Rambeau, Lautréamont, Mallarmé, Nietzsche, Marx, and Freud. With Annette Smith, I have translated and published most of the poetry Césaire wrote between 1939 and 1982. With A. James Arnold, the lead editor of Césaire's Complete Works in French, now in progress, who also recently translated the unexpurgated 1948 text of Solar Throat Slash, recently published by Wesleyan. In the late 1950s, increasingly politically focused and seeking a wider audience, Césaire, in effect, gelded the 1948 text eliminating 31 poems and editing out material to varying degrees in another 29, leaving only 12 poems untouched. Until now, only the massively revised edition, Cadastre, 1961, has been translated. In my notes at the end of Solar Throat Slashed, I provide information concerning which poems were eliminated, which material was cut from the edited poems, and which poems remained unchanged. Solar Throat Slashed is Aimé Césaire's most fulgurating collection of poetry, animistically dense, charged with eroticism and blasphemy, and imbued with African and Vaudoun spirituality. This book takes the French surrealist adventure to new heights and depths. A Césaire poem is a crisscrossing intersection in which metaphoric traceries create histori historically aware nexuses of thought and experience, jagged solidarity, apocalyptic surgery, and solar dynamite. Preliminary question. As for me, should they grab my leg, I vomit up a forest of lianas. Should they hang me by my fingernails, I piss a camel bearing a pope 
and vanish in a row of fig trees that quite neatly encircle the intruder and strangle him in a beautiful tropical balancing act. The weakness of many men is that they do not know how to become either a stone or a tree. As for me, I sometimes fit sulfurous wicks between my boa fingers for the sole pleasure of bursting into a flame of new poinsettia leaves all evening long. Reds and greens trembling in the wind like our dawn in my throat. Lynch one. Why does spring grab me by the throat? What does it want of me? So what if it does not have enough spears and banners? I jeer at you, spring, for flaunting your blind eye and your bad breath. Your debauchery, your corrupt kisses. Your peacock's tail makes spirit tables turn with patches of jungle, fanfares of marching sap. But my liver is more acidic and my venefice stronger than your malefice. Lynch. It's 6 p.m. in the mud of the bayou. It's a black handkerchief fluttering atop a pirate ship mast. It's the strangulation point of a fingernail in the carmine of an interjection. It's the pompa. It's the queen's ballet. It's the sagacity of science. It's the unforgettable coitus. Oh, lynch, salt, mercury, and antimony. Lynch is the blue smile of a dragon enemy of angels. Lynch is an orchid too lovely to bear fruit. Lynch is an entry into matter. Lynch is the hand of the wind bloodying a forest whose trees are galls brandishing in their hands the living flame of their castrated phalli. Lynch is a hand sprinkled with the dust of precious stones. Lynch is a release of hummingbirds. Lynch is a lapse. Lynch is a trumpet blast, a broken gramophone record, a cyclone's tail dragged by the pink beaks of raptors. Lynch is a gorgeous chevalier that dread flings into my face. Lynch is a temple destroyed by roots and gripped by a virgin forest. Oh, Lynch lovable companion, beautiful squirted eye, huge mouth mute, unless a jerking there spills the delirium of mucus. Weave well, lightning bolt, on your loom a continent exploding into islands, an oracle contortedly slithering like a scolopendra, a moon settling in the breach, the sulfur peacock ascending in the succinct murderous hole of my assassinated hearing. Rain. After I had by iron, by fire, by ash visited the most celebrated places in history, after I had by ash, fire, earth, and stars courted with my wild dog and leech-like fingernails, the authoritarian field of protoplasms. I found myself, as usual in the old days, in the middle of a factory of viper's nests, in a Ganges of cacti, in an elaboration of thorny pilgrimages. And as usual, I was salivated by limbs and tongues born a thousand years before the earth. And as usual, I made my morning prayer the one that protects me from the evil eye and that I address to the rain under the Aztec color of its name. Rain, who so gently washes a perverse injection from the earth's academic vagina. All powerful rain, who on the chopping block makes the fingers of the rocks leap. Rain, who force feeds an army of worms no mulberry forest could nourish. Rain, inspired strategist who pushes across the mirror of the air your zigzag army of numberless riverbanks that cannot not surprise the best kept boredom. Rain, wasp nest, beautiful milk whose piglets we are. 
Rain, I see your hair, which is a perpetual explosion of sandbox tree fireworks, your hair of misinformation promptly denied. Rain, who in your most reprehensible excesses takes care not to forget that Cherokee maidens pull suddenly from their night corsage a lamp of thrilling fireflies. Inflexible rain, who lays eggs, whose larvae are so proud that nothing can make them mount the stern of the sun and salute it like an admiral. Rain, who is a fresh fish fan behind which courteous races hide to watch victory with its dirty feet pass by. Greetings to you, Queen Rain, in the depths of the eternal goddess whose hands are multiple and whose destiny is unique, thou sperm, thou brain, thou fluid. Rain, capable of everything, except washing away the blood that flows on the fingers of the murderers of entire peoples, surprised in the soaring forests of innocence. Mississippi. Too bad for you men who don't notice that my eyes remember slings and black flags that murder with each blink of my Mississippi lashes. Too bad for you men who do not see, who do not see anything. Not even the gorgeous railway signals formed under my eyelids by the black and red discs of the coral snake that my munificence coils in my Mississippi tears. Too bad for you men who do not see that in the depth of the reticule where chance has deposited our Mississippi eyes, there waits a buffalo sunk to the very hilt of the swamp's eyes. Too bad for you men who do not see that you cannot stop me from building to his fill egg-headed islands of flagrant sky under the calm ferocity of the immense geranium of our sun. Blues. The first word in this poem is Spanish, aguacero. It means a brief sudden shower. In his poem, Black Stone on a White Stone, Cesar Vallejo proclaimed that he would die in one in Paris. He didn't. Blues. Aguacero, beautiful musician, unclothed at the foot of a tree, amidst the lost harmonies, close to our defeated memories, amidst our hands of defeat, and peoples of a strength strange, we let our eyes hang, and native, loosing the leading rein of a sorrow, we wept. Transmutation. A tree thrusts against a wall its quarrel of twisted pipe. In the absence of any objective reference, the cataracts have hung in their windows the laundry that hygienic women soil with their menses to such an extent that nothing is more personal than the sacking of time. The tanned necks of prostitutes alone still give meaning to the infinite. However much I point out that I have not proved unworthy, they leave me alone. Defense! A storm screams at me incessantly, always foretold, always deferred, nourishing the unconscious of our crowds with all the perpetea of nightmare. Happily, they did not notice that I noticed that I have my hands to keep me company. I have my monkey tail hands, I have my booby trap hands, 
I have my assassin hands. I have my sleepwalker hands. And sometimes, when my pulse beats the lapse of remorse risen from Atlantis, I have my shell hands. I also have my guano hands that are so lovely they are called Sierra Nevadas. I have my pigeon flies hands. I have my diving suit hands. I also have my hands for rocking the little children who come to me since my most spiritual exercise consists in trying to stop myself. I have righteous hands which affected by mildew never become mature. My incendiary hands, my bicolored hands, my miliary fever hands, my generally insignificant hands, my pearl diver hands that are accustomed to the depths. For rainy days, I have my curious eared seal hands that I will not describe, for that would be a sacrilege. On feast days, I have these sumptuous hands that an old emperor donned in Cusco to greet the sun. I have my hands that are mirrors for setting fire to my hands to serve as a scarecrow for the birds of the solstice. All the way from Akkad, from Elam, from Sumir. A figure is identified in this poem as master of the three paths. And uh, Arnold has written, my co-translator Jim Arnold has written, that the master of the three paths is probably the Vodun Legba, uh, the Loa invoked to open a path between this world and the spirit world. Master of the three paths, you have before you a man who has walked a lot. Master of the three paths, you have before you a man who has walked on his hands, on his feet, on his belly, on his backside, all the way from Elam, from Akkad, from Sumer. Master of the three paths, you have before you a man who has carried a lot. And truly, my friends, I have carried. I have carried all the way from Elam, from Akkad, from Sumir. I have carried the commandant's body. I have carried the commandant's railroad. I have carried the commandant's locomotive, the commandant's cotton. I have carried on my nappy head that gets along just fine without a little cushion, God, the machine, the road, the commandant's God. Master of the three paths, I have carried under the sun, I have carried in the mist, I have carried over the ember shards of legionary ants, I have carried the parasol, I have carried the explosives, I have carried the iron collar, and, as on the shores of the Nile you see in the soft mud, the just foot of the Ebus, I have left everywhere on the banks, on the mountains, on the shores, the gri-gri of my can-can feet, all the way from Akkad, from Elam, from Sumer. Master of the three paths, master of the three channels, may it please you for once, the first time since Akkad, since Elam, since Sumer. My muzzle, apparently more tanned than the calluses on my feet, but in reality softer than the crow's scrupulous beak, and as if draped supernaturally in bitter folds provided by my borrowed gray skin, a livery men force onto me every winter, that I may advance through the dead leaves with my little sorcerer steps toward where the inexhaustible injunction of men thrown to the knotted sneers of the hurricane threatens triumphantly all the way from Elam, from Akkad, from Sumir. Calm. 
Time shall, of course, be void of sin. Gates shall buckle under the assault of waters. Orchids shall push their sweet, violent, torture victim heads through the open work that words form two by two. Lianas shall dispatch from the depth of their vigils a luminous battery of leeches whose embrace shall have the irresistible, irresistible force of perfumes. From each grain of sand, a bird shall be born. From each simple flower, a scorpion shall emerge, everything being compound. The Dorsera's trumpets shall blast to mark the hour for abdicating my thick needle implanted lips in favor of the flexible armature of future aloes. The omission of naive flesh around pain shall be generalized outside of any relationship with the bivalvular incursion of cestodes while the swallows born of my saliva shall agglutinate with the algae carried by the waves that rise from you, the bloody myth of a never murmured moment. On the platforms of the towers of silence, the vultures shall take flight in their beaks, shreds of old flesh, too uncalm for our skeletons. At the locks of the void. In the foreground, and in longitudinal flight, a dried up brook, drowsy roller of obsidian pebbles. In the background, a decidedly not calm architecture of torn down bergs, of eroded mountains on whose glimpsed phantom, serpents, chariots, a cat's eye, and alarming constellations are born. It is a strange firefly cake hurled into the gray face of time, a vast scree of shards of icons and blazons, of lice in the beard of Saturn. On the right, very curiously standing against the squamous wall of crucified butterfly wings open in majesty, a gigantic bottle whose very long golden neck drinks a drop of blood in the clouds. As for me, I'm no longer thirsty. It gives me pleasure to think of the world undone like an old copra mattress, like an old voodoo necklace, like the perfume of a felled peccary. I am no longer thirsty. All heads belong to me. It is sweet to be gentle as a lamb. It is sweet to open the great sluice gates of gentleness. Through the staggered sky, through the exploded stars, through the tutelary silence, from very far beyond myself I come toward you, woman sprung from a beautiful laburnum. And your eyes, wounds, barely closed on your modesty at being born. It is I who sings with a voice still caught up in the babbling of elements. It is sweet to be a piece of wood, a cork, a drop of water in the torrential waters of the end and of the new beginning. It is sweet to doze off in the shattered heart of things. I no longer have any sort of thirst. My sword bade from a shark's tooth smile is becoming terribly useless. My mace is very obviously out of season and out of play. Rain is falling. It is a crisscross of rubble. It is a skein of iron for reinforced concrete. It is an incredible stowage of the invisible by first-rate ties. It is a branch work of syphilis. It is the diagram of a brandy bender. It is the graphic representation of a seismic flood tide. It is conspiracy of daughters. It is the nightmare's head impaled on the lance point of a mob mad for peace and for bread. I advance to the region of blue lakes. I advance to the region of sulfur springs. 
I advanced to my crateriform mouth toward which have I struggled enough? What have I to discard? Everything by God, everything. I am stark naked. I have discarded everything. My genealogy, my widow, my companions. I await the boiling. I await the baptism of sperm. I await the wing beat of the great seminal albatross supposed to make a new man of me. I await the immense tap, the vertiginous slap that will consecrate me as a knight of a plutonium order. I await in the depths of my pores the sacred intrusion of the benediction. And suddenly, it is the outpouring of great rivers. It is the friendship of Toucan's eyes. It is the fulminating erection of virgin mountains. I am pregnant with my despair in my arms. I am pregnant with my hunger in my arms and my disgust in my mouth. I am invested. Europe patrols my veins like a pack of filaria at the stroke of midnight to think that their philosophies tried to provide them with morals. That ferocious race won't have put up with it. Europe, pig iron fragment. Europe, low tunnel oozing a bloody dew. Europe, old bag Europe. Europe, old dog. Europe, worm-drawn coach. Europe, peeling tattoo. Europe, your name is a raucous clucking and a muffled shock. I unfold my handkerchief. It is a flag. I have donned my beautiful skin. I have adjusted my beautiful clawed paws. Europe, I hereby join all that powders the sky with its insolence, all that is loyal and fraternal, all that has the courage to be eternally new, all that knows how to yield its heart to the fire, all that has the strength to emerge from an inexhaustible sap, all that is calm and certain, all that is not you, Europe, eminent name, of the turd. I'll read two more pieces, and then uh, if you have any responses or questions or comments, I'll do my best to respond. Horse, one of the two dedicated poems in the collection. This is for Pierre Loeb who was an art dealer in Paris in the 30s and 40s. My horse stumbles over skulls hopscotched in rust. My horse rears in a storm of clouds which are putrefactions of shipwrecked flesh. My horse neighs in the fine rain of roses and sediments that my blood creates in the scenery of the street fairs. My horse stumbles over the clumps of cacti that are the entangled vipers of my torments. My horse stumbles, neighs, and stumbles toward the curtain of blood, of my blood pulled down on all the pimps shooting craps for my blood. My horse stumbles before the impossible flame of the barrier howled at by the vesicles of my blood. My horse rears before the great pillar of hyacinth, perfectly pure, that rises to the glory of the Lord and descends to the depths of the shed of my blood. My horse rears before a barrel lamp made from fireflies peddled by my blood. I saw, too, a great horse of ardent peace that dashed forward pawing the ground from a season of rains, of mollusks, of an anger of hair, of a harangue of pyramids, of a camisole of old corks, of a confusion of mushroom spittle. Great horse, my blood to be spilled in public squares, my blood in which, from time to time, a woman in solar perfection shoots out all her tuberous stems and vanishes in a tornado born on the far side of the world. My blood for a foot freshly repainted as a gibbet, my blood that no canonization has ever soiled. 
My blood, the wine of a drunkard's vomit. My blood that no paid off judge has ever heard. I give it to you, great horse. I give you my ears to be made into nostrils capable of quivering, my hair to be made into a mane as wild as they come, my tongue to be made into mustang hose. I give them to you, great horse, so that you may approach the extreme limit of brotherhood, the men of elsewhere and of tomorrow. On your back, a child, of the furrow with barely moving lips, who for you shall disarm the chlorophyllian crumb of the vast crows of the future. Barbarity. This is the word that sustains me and strikes against my brass carcass, where in the rust garret the moon devours the barbarous bones of cowardly prowling beasts of the lie. Barbarity of rudimentary language and our face is beautiful as the true operative power of negation. Barbarity of the dead circulating in the veins of the earth who at times come to smash their heads against the walls of our ears, and the screams of revolt never heard that turn in tune and musical tone. Barbarity, the singular article. Barbarity, the horned lizard. Barbarity, the white amphis bena. Barbarity, I, the spitting cobra from my putrefying flesh awakening, suddenly a flying gecko, suddenly a fringed gecko. And I adhere so well to the very loci of strength that to forget me, you'll have to throw the hairy flesh of your chest to the dogs. I believe in what I call accurate translation. I don't believe in transfigurations or imitations or, or the idea of the translator poet sort of um, turning the foreign text into his own work. Um, so I really believe in accurate translations that are fully researched and responsible, often with footnotes, etc. There's a scholarly aspect to it. And at the same time, I feel uh, that translation should be up to the performance level of the original. Uh, these two goals are sometimes quite conflictive. And I also feel that you have to create a kind of tonal personality in the translation, so it doesn't sound as if it's been made by a machine. Yeah. So that, in essence, I don't have any particular translation theory. It's just. Uh, I try to do good, clean work. How did Césaire uh, uh, help or point the, you and, and your co-translators in the direction of what you ended up with? Well, I, I met with him twice in, in, caf in cafes in Paris. His Parisian publisher, Presence African, set up these meetings. And uh, he took time from his busy schedule to meet me, and we sat for an hour or so. And I, each time I would bring my word list. Uh, there's, there's words in Césaire that are very, very difficult to research because they're not in most dictionaries. And some of them are African words uh, that he has brought into his poetry. And I was at, this was in the late, uh, this would be the late 70s. And uh, I was asking him questions about some poems that he'd written 30 
40 years ago. And he, sometimes he didn't remember. He said, I don't remember writing that. You know? <laughs> but very nice man, not pompous, very gentle, sweet, a really a stunning human being, I felt. The third time we got together with Jim Arnold and Annette Smith in one of his son's apartments. He invited us over for lunch and we spent the afternoon there. I remember we sat at a table under a magnificent painting by his friend, Wifredo Lamb. And there is on the cover of Solar Throat Slashed a wonderful painting by Lamb, which his son, Eskel, gave us permission to use. So we spent the afternoon, and often he would get up and run over to the bookcases and pull out an African-French dictionary to make sure that he was giving us a, the right response to a question. And we finally got all of our questions answered. That was, that was wonderful. And at the end of the afternoon, we said, well, read us a poem. So he chose Cor Perdu, Lost Body, which is the title poem of a small collection of 10 poems that was published in 1950. And that was it. Yes? Did his style change during the years, or was it always pretty much Well, as you might have picked up from my introduction to this book, Césaire went through a sea change in the 50s. And as he became more politically involved, he sought a wider audience. And he decided that the, his writing from the 40s which included the first version of Notebook of Return to the Native Land, as well as The Miraculous Weapons, his first book, and Solar Throat Slashed, his second, were too surrealistic, too blasphemous, too dense. And he really, it, from my point of view, ruined the poems. Um, he continued to write. He, there's a collection called Ferriman, uh, or Shackles, uh, that was written in the 50s. And it's mainly full of poems that are extremely elegiac because by this point, uh, his challenge to have made a true change in the life of Martinican citizens, he had realized that he was not going to be able to do. And so at the beginning of the political career, this is this great sense of optimism. I mean, the notebook of return to the native land is, is an extraordinarily affirmative document. And 20 years later, why? the sadness set in. You know? So that's the main change of the movement from a uh, surrealist to a quasi-surrealist, polit politically focused, civil focused poem, poetry. Yeah. Yes? Uh, I, I lived in France for 20 years, and I was often surprised at the capacity the French have to resist <laughs> any forms of integration. So you see around Paris these these communities of the colonies that right. used to exist, and there's no way, because the, the society is so divided up, so corporatist, yes. that there's no penetration. So mm. everybody gets, you know, make sure they have mm -hmm. their, their turf taken care of. How, my question is, how did uh, César feel? He, he was received in France. Did he feel he penetrated in any sense Culture, which it, hmm. you know, Gee, that's a, that's, a, that's a wonderful question that you could probably write a long essay on, you know. Um, Andre Breton, who I quoted, wrote one of the most, you know, affirmative pieces on a poet that I've ever read. Breton loved his work, and he met, as a student in Paris, he met other African blacks that he, you know, began to form his concept of negritude with. I don't think that the Surrealists as such really paid much attention to his work. And as he became more politically engaged, he was partially responsible for the decolonization of Martinique and of the changing of Martinique from a colony to a department, Outremer, overseas department, which is a compromise between being a colony and being independent. Uh, he didn't feel that Martinique was ready for independence. He's been severely criticized for this. A more revolutionary people today, recent generations, have felt that he should have gone all the way. Uh, it's a complicated thing, and I'm, I'm not an authority on it, though I know about it. Um, I don't know how he is, re UNESCO is, is, has declared that 2013 will be the year of Césaire. 
So UNESCO's right there for him. To what extent that he's read by contemporary French poets, I have no idea. I have no idea. No. No. I know my, my friend, the poet Michel de Guy, who publishes a marvelous international magazine, Poesy, has published Césaire from time to time, but he's there along with, you know, 25 or 30 other poets. So, uh, no, as a translator, I've, I've most, mainly lived with the text, and I haven't, I've never been lured into considering a biography or anything like that. You know? So there's a lot I don't know about him. Yeah. Well, there's, in France, there's, a, there's an enormous uh, worship of the older poets, and uh, they spend enormous amounts of time in school memorizing these poems and everything else. But when I would, when I would try to see uh, how much modern poetry had penetrated people around me, it was like a blank. It was uh, difficult to imagine that, uh, you know, that um, this sort of sens sensitizing themselves to poetry in this sense had opened no interest in approaching these other sort of contagions from the colonies. And well, and very little foreign poetry gets translated into French, too. Uh, and the French don't really pay that much attention to foreign poets. I was told that the selected poems of Wallace Stevens, which came out in the 1980s, had sold something like 50 copies in several years. You know, Allen Ginsberg was very popular, but m mainly as a cultural figure, right? And of course, Charles Bukowski. I mean, they adored Bukowski. But well, that's mainly because of personality, uh, Bukowski's personality and so on. Bukowski, well, Carol and I were in uh, Paris in 1973. That little story is kind of funny, I can tell you. Uh, Bukowski came through and appeared on an um, interview program called Apostrophe. And he was sitting at a table, and he had his two bottles of Sancerre, you know, because Hemingway drank it, right? And during the interview, there was a woman sitting next to him, and he began to grope the woman as he got drunker, and finally she screamed and ran off camera, and the interview was terminated. And I heard about it the next day, and a couple of people said to me, French people, said, you know, Bukowski, there is a poet. <laughs> you know? So Wallace Stevens, no. Charles Bukowski, yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, this is a much more pedestrian question, but as a translator dedicated to accuracy, what do you do about the problems of rhyme and meter, or are those not problems? Well, translating sonnets, let's say, are a translator's nightmare. And for the most part, I've stayed away from rhymed verse. In doing the complete poetry of Cesar Vallejo, I finally had to face Los Heraldos Negros, The Black Heralds, which is his first book, and most of it is rhymed verse. And I compromised. I, I translated mainly for meaning, but I tried to constantly think of the sound of what I was translating so that some of the sonnets, if I were to read them to you, you could sort of hear a sonnet shape. They won't rhyme exactly, but they're close. But uh, you have to finally, in a sense, make a decision. Are you going to translate for meaning? Or are you going to reconfigure the poem to make it sound like a sonnet? I mean, there are pieces, there are poems of Rilke and Rambeau in Robert Lowell's imitations that are beautifully rhymed. They have virtually nothing to do with the original. There's two or three translation errors per line, you know. So um, it's it's, re it's an unresolvable problem. I don't know. No. No. Yes. Uh, speaking of Vallejo, <clears throat> could you say something about the particular problems of translating, say, French as a language in the English, as opposed to the experience you had translating Spanish? Well, the, the, the differences are mainly in the personalities of the poets, you know. Um, both Césaire and Vallejo are very complex, and, and doing good translations of them involve a lot of research and doing multiple drafts, and in many cases I work with a co-translator. My, my French and my Spanish is mainly self-taught, and I'm not fluent in either language. 
Uh, I spent a lot of time with dictionaries, both in French and Spanish. Uh, to make a differentiation between working with Spanish in Vallejo and French in Césaire, nothing immediately comes to my mind to, to say to you. Um, I worked on Vallejo for 42 years, so maybe he's more difficult than, 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 than Césaire. I kept retranslating Vallejo. But see, I started translating Vallejo when I was a young sort of apprentice to poetry, and I came into poetry through translating the poem of Sumanos. I decided that that would be my apprentice work to poetry. I would apprentice myself to the human poems of Vallejo and enter poetry through a translation of that book. I had no idea what I was taking on. And uh, the first edition came out in 1968, published by Grove Press, and then there's been two further editions, each time considerably reworked. And the final, the complete poetry of Cesar Vallejo was published by University of California Press in 2007, and that's it, you know. <laughs> so I, I encountered Cesar more in my, you know, f toward the, you know, after I had a career as a writer, and after I had sort of my own principles and positions. And so meeting his work was, I was more formed, and the work has gone faster than the Vallejo work. But they're both very complex figures. I don't really know in the, la on the, in the long run, you know, who is the most difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? I understand that Césaire um, remained pretty much staunchly anti-colonial, an anti-colonialist up until the day he died, and that there was uh, a time when Sarkozy wanted to be <laughs> He wouldn't speak to Sarkozy. Right. Yeah. yeah, I don't know much about that. I don't know exactly what Sarkozy did that led the very elderly Césaire to refuse to meet with him. I know that Sarkozy then went to Martinique for the funeral, so he was still you know, knocking on the door, as it, as it were. Um, no, he was, no, he was, his anti-colonialism, I think, is absolutely thoroughgoing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes? I think Sarkozy praised colon French colonialism, that's what it Was that it? Yeah. yeah, oh God, bad, yeah. yeah. I see. Yes? Can't hear you. Kind of what? A kind of nationalism. Nationalism? No, no, no. The, the negritude was thought of as a kind of pan-African movement. It wasn't like targeted to any particular country. And uh, Césaire writes a kind of poetry that has no really nationalist flavor whatsoever. I mean, most Martinicans can't make any sense out of Amy Césaire's poetry. I mean, Amy Césaire is writing for Marla May. That's who's in the chair, if you want to say, who is, who is his listener? It's Baudelaire and it's Mallarmé, and it's his invasion of the French language to take the French language away from the mainland French and to write as a Martinican in, in the French language, and that thus he, uh, no interest in Creole. I mean, he couldn't possibly have written the body of work that he has in, in Creole. So no, I don't think, I don't think Césaire is nationalistic at all. What can translate into English? Given that it's very much concerned with the project of taking the French language out of the French history, this is a European thing, do you think that kind of raises any problems translating it into English? No, no problems. <laughs> Not quite sure I understand your question, but let's say no problems. Okay, well, th thanks for coming. <laughs>